You are writing a story with your life, and it's interwoven with my story. Let's make it a real page turner. Sometimes we may laugh, and sometimes we may cry, but we can face whatever may come because we have faith for the journey, hope for the future, and love for those who are drawn onward with us through the story. I'm Teresa Jansen, and this is Drawn Onward. Well, good day and welcome to Drawn Onward. Today, I have a special guest with me. I have Jackie Midler. Welcome, Jackie. Hi, thank you. So you and I met because uh, we are both part of a collaborative book project called She Writes for Him, Stories of Living Hope. And But I understand that's not your first book, is it? I had written another book that came out in May called White Stick. Okay, what was it that really kind of spurred you into uh, faith? Yeah, so my story is kind of crazy. It, um, you know, like I said, I was Catholic all the way up and went to church every Sunday. So I knew of God and I knew um, I knew of him, but I always kind of had a very distant thought process with him. And then when, like, I just thought he was always like angry. You always had to kind of repent or something or he was going to get you. And then um, when I kind of went to like my junior, senior year of high school, I went to this more of a hippie mindset where he was energy and it wasn't really God. And, and then in college, I kind of, and this is where my, my story white stick really um, takes place is my time in college. But I really did a number on myself because I didn't have any moral, I didn't have a moral um you know, guidepost. I just was up to myself. And so I, I slept around, I got pregnant, I had abortions, I did drugs. And so honestly, at the end, the tail end of college, I remember thinking like, I can't do this the rest of my life. I need something different. And God had set up a series of, of events where I had lost my job. And then I went down to my uncles in Florida, like my great grandmother died. I met my uncle at the funeral. I mean, I had already known him, but I saw him at the funeral and he was like, hey, you should come stay with me if you need help. Cause he kind of knew I was struggling. And then I went back from the funeral, ended up losing my job, calling my uncle and saying, I'm coming. And um, down there, my other uncle was also there with his family and they were Christians. And they invited me to church for, you know like a Christian church, which was different than Catholic church. And um, I had never really seen God in that way before. And so it was interesting for me. It just, um, it really opened my eyes up to um, God. And I can't say that I, I was open to necessarily having a relationship with him at that point, but I came home from Florida after about three and a half weeks. And um, I, I um, started studying the Bible with a group of girls that I'd met at one of the sister churches up in Rhode Island. And um, then on June 20th of 1999, I decided to commit to God and then get rebaptized. And um, from there, I was just kind of whatever God wanted me to do, I was open to. I, um, I truly just, you know, wanted to please him. I'd already done so much in my life wrong that I felt like it was a really good opportunity for me to do whatever God wanted me to. That's great. I love that you know the exact date. I love it when people, you know, have that new birth day, you know, type of thing. So wonderful. Thank you yeah. for sharing that. Yeah. So when, sure. at what point in time did writing become part of your journey? So that's crazy story because quite honestly, I never, now my husband will say, he will say, you said you always wanted to write a book. And I'm like, I think I said a lot of things like I was an actress. I always wanted to do great things and do all, go all over the place and experience life and do everything. So potentially I said that, but it was never like a goal or in my radar where I was going to be a writer or write. And I honestly never thought I was ever good enough to write anything, to be honest. Um, I wasn't, you know, I didn't do that well in school to where I thought, oh yeah, I'm going to be an English major or something like that. Um, so it was about um, three and a half years ago that I had gone to a concert of this indie artist and um, it was a pro-choice um, concert and I didn't know. And the indie artist was one of the artists that I had listened to when I was in college. And so it brought back all this, these memories. It was just really kind of a really surreal crazy experience. And I just remember thinking, I'll speak on your behalf, God, if you want me to speak, if you want me to be a voice for this, you know, for abortion, I, I will, because it seemed like everyone besides me and my friend at that 
um, concert really just were so for abortion and having had a couple of abortions, I knew how devastating it was for you and for, you know, for me and for people. And so I thought I'll be your voice. And so I just started writing. I started to write down my story. Um, it took me about six months and a, I wrote about 9,000 words, which I thought was so awesome. <laughs> uh-huh. But anyone who's a writer knows 9,000 words is not really a book, it's not a book. <laughs> so, <laughs> but I was really proud of myself. Like I was like, yay. And so then for like a year and a half, um, well, about a year or so, I, you know, I sent it around to a couple of my friends to get, you know, their opinion and what I should do. And I just kept praying and being faithful and just being like, all right, God, what do you want me to do? And I really, um, and then I moved again during that time. And um, I met another woman in New Orleans and, you know, she was a doula and I became a doula and did stillbirth doula, which really brought up a lot more memories of like, you know, death and babies and just the birth process. And I just, still had it on my heart to do, you know, be his voice. And, you know, I started researching different things and um, crazily enough, one, um, I kept praying through this time for about three years that God would come to me in a dream or a vision with his purpose. He would tell me what his purpose is for me. And um, I had met my friend, Michelle had come and I'd given her my 9,000 word, you know, manuscript. And um, she said, you know, she was my first friend that she's a librarian. She has her master's from, um, from Brown University. So she was like, yeah, this isn't a book. So, you know, if you don't want it to do it, you know, this isn't a book either. I mean, it could be like a pamphlet, you know, she's just really honest, <laughs> which was great. You know, as a writer, you want people to be honest in your life because you don't want to spend all this time you know, writing something that's, that's not good. (laughs) Right. And so, um, she, she said, you know, she started asking me questions like who's your audience and you know, what's your purpose. And some things were very unclear in what I was writing. And so, you know, I was really started to get excited about it, but my kids had gotten off of, um, school and for the summer break, and there was no way I was going to be able to write a book in the summertime. And then one night I went to bed and um, it was crazy. It was like otherworldly. I sound a little crazy saying it, but um, I stood in this great multitude of people. And in the center was this like circle bowl thing. And there was, Jesus was standing there and he just said, who will speak for these souls on my behalf? And he looked right at me. Everybody else was gray. And um, I said, I will, I already said I would. And he goes, well, what have you done? And I said, well, I wrote this manuscript, this 9,000 word book. And he goes, I go, but I don't really know what to do with it. Like, I don't really know. And he goes, well, while you've waited, countless thousands have died. And I was like, oh my gosh. And so I was like, well, what do you want me to do? Just tell me what you want me to do and I'll do it. And he said, you know what to do. And I woke up. (laughs) Wow. It was weird. It was, it was like, what did that happen? Like I questioned it for like, a couple of minutes, obviously. And then I just decided, okay, I'm gonna, I know what to do. I need to write the book. That's what I need to do. And so I did. And so what's crazy about that experience was that in three days I had written over 16,000 words. It was like the Holy Spirit was just pouring through me. I had, I wrote this book. It was, it originally was about 55,000 words, 56,000 words. And I wrote it in like you know, six weeks at the most. And I'm talking five days a week, only doing two hours a day of writing. That's it. I mean, it just poured out of me. I was writing anywhere from a thousand to 2000 words per day. It just, it just flowed. And so from there, then I, you know, sent it to one of my friends who is actually a Christian writer, published Christian writer that, that um, has a publisher and does really well and said, Hey, what do you think about this? And he, you know, said, it's a good, it's good, you know, here and then I found, you know, the publisher and continued on the journey. And then in May of this year, we had a book. So okay. it's been, it's been a crazy experience. And I've had a lot of great um, comments about the book. And I've had a lot of women who have had similar experiences reach out and just say how much it's helped them in their relationship with God. And that's the whole purpose. I mean, I didn't, I wrote the book so that even one soul would be, would know the grace that God can give. Absolutely. Okay, so as far as the book goes, the white stick, that is how you found Redemption Press. And that's, I'm assuming, is that how you found about out about She Writes for Him Stories of Living Hope? Yes. Okay. Yes. All right. That's great. Um, 
is it the same continuation of the same story? I saw that your story is in the table of contents under the topic of suffering. Um, yes, yes, it is the same continuation. So it's just basically some excerpts from the book that I wrote, but then it's just a little bit more um, uh, honestly about suffering in the sense that just how I think with abortion, the thing that's interesting is a lot of people leave it at concept, you know, I'm pregnant and I have an abortion and then that's the conversation. And I always say like, it's kind of the same thing with pregnancy. Everyone talks about the pregnancy and the birth, but no one talks mm -hmm. about the six weeks after birth where, you know, you're a mess, you know, like your right. ears just contract. You're like, no, no one told me about uterine contractions. You know, no one told me about how, like my belly wouldn't go back right away or how I would feel hormonally or, you know, trying to nurse a baby. I mean, there's just like stuff that women just don't talk about. Right. And mm -hmm. I think that's the same thing with abortion. It's like people talk about, oh, there's this life, there's this baby and you're killing this baby. And people talk about, well, it's abortion. It's my choice. I should be able to not be pregnant, but no one really talks about the after effects of once you choose abortion, what happens to the trajectory of your life, what can happen. Okay. You know, and I've met I and talked to all kinds of women about this in my life. And so suff with suffering, you really do suffer as a woman who's had an abortion. There's very few women that I've, there's no women actually I've ever talked to in my experience that have ever been like, yeah, I'm glad I did it. And I don't, I don't, I don't think about it anymore. Not one wow. woman. And I've talked to hundreds. I mean, there are women that will say like, I've, I did it. I'm, I regret doing it, but I don't, I'm okay now. Yes. I've met those women, but I've never met a woman that's like, I'm glad I did it. And I don't feel any different about it. You're right. I haven't ever had that conversation with anyone. You know, we um, talk about it more abstractly. And if it's been a part of your story, then um, I, I don't think people tend to talk about it much at all unless they have to, you know. Right. I don't know. Yeah. And certainly not very deeply. So, no. I mean, the, the thing is, is that, you know, the, what people will say is, you know, God uses, uses your sin, uses your mistakes, he uses everything, right? And so because I have had this experience and because I made that choice, as much as I regret it and wish I didn't do it, it's opened a wide door because as soon as I start talking about it, women are then comfortable sharing to me. I've, I've had women that have never shared it with anyone else. Yeah. that have shared it with me. I've had husbands that have never told their wives that their girlfriend in college had one. I mean, I've had, I mean, I have had like a tremendous amount of people that only a couple people know, and I'm one of them. And it's only because I had the similar experience. So Absolutely. it's because they don't, they won't feel judged. They won't feel put down. And, and I can completely 100% understand what they're going through and what they feel. That, that is exactly how God works. You know, he doesn't use our, um, whatever the, blue ribbon moments of life that I won the most Bible memorization, you know, right. <laughs> he doesn't use those award moments to touch no. people's lives. He uses the broken, the brokenness, the, um, the suffering, the outcast, the, all of it. And as I've been talking to different authors who are in this collaborative project, that is the theme. Of course, the book is about stories of living hope and you long for hope when you're in a, a point of needing it. And so it makes sense. That's been my life theme. And it sounds like yours too, is that after that time of brokenness, then comes the our own healing, and then the opportunity to walk alongside someone else in their brokenness. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Then it becomes, it's this ability to be usable in our brokenness or through our brokenness, usable by yeah. God and available and ready to talk about stuff, very personal and be prepared to be judged maybe by people who don't understand completely. Have, has that been part of your experience? Have you? So what's interesting is I will say God made me like a very open person. <laughs> I don't know. Sometimes I'm like, now I'm, you know, I'm 44 now and I'm like, Sometimes I'm like, Jackie, shut your mouth. Why are you saying that? You know, like, 
And, but I somehow I just can't like, I can't stop myself. I don't know. I'm so open. It's ridiculous. I'm like, sometimes I'm like, I don't have to say this, but I mean, not in regards to abortion, but just in regards to anything, I'll tell anyone, anything. I really, I just am that kind of a person, but and as far as abortion and being judged, I feel like, yes, you know, I do. I, even in my book, it talks about it a little bit, like how, you know, I had a friend who had an abortion. She was a, a part of my journey um, in her past. And then she had been talking about it amongst to the churches. And, and I thought, and she said that she had people come up to her and say, you know, how dare you think you can come in here and speak to us after you've done something like that. And um and I, I mean, I was like, whoa. And she goes, yeah. And I'm like, that doesn't sound like Christ at all. <laughs> I mean, you know, we all have sin. We all have things that we've done wrong. And yes, there's deeper consequences. And I think that's really the thing to remember. There's deeper consequences for the more, the worse the sin is. And so having someone in a church come up and judge you, it's like, you know, I, I killed a baby. Like you coming up and putting your judgment on me is only going to, hurt me more, but you can't really hurt me as much as I'm hurting myself for what I've done. Do you know? And so I feel like as Christians, it's just so important that we, we don't sit in the judgment seat of, of Christ. We just don't because, you know, it, it's not, that's not what, that's not what God has for us. That's not, right. that's what, not what we were created to do. Absolutely not. Yeah. I, 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 say oftentimes, you know, when someone says, is this situation right? Or is this person wrong and stuff? And I'm like, well, I have the Bible, but what God does with that situation is above my pay grade. It's not even, it's not my concern at all. My concern is to be um, open, available, willing, um, loving, gracious. When we, I think when we pass judgment on someone else for something that they have done, especially something that they've repented of and or they're already in healing. That's, you know, for sure. How can you even judge someone? It's like saying God's grace isn't big enough for that, for that big mistake. Right. right. You know? No, it's true. Yeah. And, and why, who are we to limit God on what exactly then, then we're judging God. We're not even judging that person. And if God mm -hmm. said that his grace can cover anything um, and not only cover that, that but then he places his own righteousness on us you know so who are we then to say otherwise you know right i mean his holy spirit's inside of me it's like i have his holy spirit who's dwelling in inside of me and it's like who are you to judge me and tell me i'm not worthy I exactly. mean, if his Holy Spirit has chosen me, you know, and I, yeah. I, and I, and I feel like it, I feel like the thing, the reason why I spoke about the church, I mean, yes, there's other people that would judge me for sure that aren't Christians, but I, I don't really, you know, their judgment doesn't hold anything uh, on me comparative to Christians. And I feel like Christians are held to a different standard because we're held to the standard of the Bible and we re represent God to the broken world. And so hearing that Christians are judging other Christians you know, it's like, ugh. and it, and it's hard. I mean, I get it. I can be judgmental too. Like, you know, you hear someone cheating on their wives and, or their husbands and they're Christian. You're like, wow, why would you do that? You know, but it's, you know, but it, it doesn't have to be a, you're not worthy of this. It just has to, you can hate the sin, but love the sinner. Yeah. Really. Yeah. And be open and allow for restoration and transformation, you know, that, and because something has happened at one point in time in your life doesn't mean that it's where you are later in your life. I don't want to be judged today based by based on who I was. No, <laughs> no, no. I always laugh because I'm like, oh, my gosh, because, you know, there was a movement in our culture in the last, you know, number of years where people were being judged based on what they said, maybe even 10 years ago or five years ago or 20 years ago. And I'm like, Oh, far be it for me if someone had a tape recorder during that four years of my life. It was terrible. I would have, I mean, I'd be condemned for sure based yeah. on the things I said, did, and who I was. And I, you know, I do, I do feel like, you know, who are we to judge? Absolutely. I, I look at David. Honestly, David has been a huge, he helped me. King David helped me in a lot, in a lot of ways in my walk with God, because whenever I felt really unworthy or whenever I felt really like, you know, oh, I'm so bad. I would think of him and I would be like, he called him after his own heart. And why yes. did he do that? 
You know, why was David a man after his own heart? And I really believe it was because David trusted God. Mm-hmm. He just not trusted because him. He, he fully trusted him. Not yeah. because he was good. Right. <laughs> exactly. He was I holy, the, you know, necessarily. I just, I mean, I'm in the middle of writing a devotional series right now with that same theme. And I just wrote one exactly about that. It wasn't David's um, abilities, his parenting style, the, the, the devotional is made for parents, parents of adults. Oh, cool. He was oh, yeah. he was not the greatest parent, <laughs> you know, no. let alone husband or no. or anything. He was Mm-mm. so um, but and yet he was a man after God's own heart. What does your um, support structure look like now for the writing process, but also for your ministry? And as you're um, really tackling, this is a big issue, and it's a polarizing issue where people get pretty emotional too yeah. about it. So what does that look like in your life? So, you know, I, I feel like when I told God I'd be his voice, <clears throat> there's a certain amount of trust that had to come with that. Right. Cause like, so for me, you know, I wanted to be a famous actress and do all these things and be out in the limelight. And then through my thirties, God just showed me like the glories for him alone. And so then I started to just back away and kind of do my own ministries and quieter and not be so, and I just matured a lot really. Mm -hmm. And I think with this ministry, you know, I don't feel like my book is a political one. I'm not trying to change the laws. I'm really just trying to tackle one heart at a time, one soul at a time you know, and I feel like it's really important. And I feel like God will do what he will do with the book and he will touch who he will touch with the book and he will open up doors or shut doors based upon what he wants to do. And um, because he came to me, you know, in that vision, I feel very confident in the fact that, um, you know, I don't have to open the doors. Now that doesn't mean I sit back and do nothing, you know? Um, but I do, I do feel like sometimes I'm like, oh, you know, where do I push? Where do I not push? A, one of my bestest friends, um, husband is, um, a well-known Christian author. Um, and he writes different books. His name is Dan Darling and he has a podcast and, um, I'll reach out to him periodically for advice or questions. And, and, um, you know, I, I just put myself out there and allow God to open or close the doors. So recently in November, um, the pastors at our church, um, the associate pastor, he works for a Christian high school in um, the area. And one of the ladies I met um, at the Pregnancy Choices was like, you should be speaking to middle, you know, high school students. And I'm like, really? And she goes, yes, they need to hear this message. So that next week, like that was on a Friday and on a Sunday, I just went up to him and was like, hey, do you think your, you know, your school would want me to come in and talk? He had read my book and, you know, want me to come in and talk about my book. And he goes, yeah, I do. And so in November, I went and was able to speak in front of about 450 um, high school kids, half were on Zoom and half were in the um, gym. And I was able to just share my story and just share, you know, it wasn't in vivid detail or anything, but just share my story and just really talk about how every choice has a consequence and how each choice will put you on a path and how the best choice to have is the choice for God. And so in regards to like how my support system is, my husband has been awesome. He has been really great. You know, self-publishing is, it can be expensive and he was willing to allow me to use that source of income for, to publish and, um, you know, was really supportive and my family, extended family, my parents have been really supportive. You know, this is a part of their lives too. You know, I'm a reflection of them and, and they had to live through this with me and, um, we're very supportive of that. Um, so tell us where can people connect with you if they want to find a white stick, where can they get that? And how can people follow you? Sure. So, um, White Stick is on Amazon and it's also in Redemption Press. And then um, I do have a website, which is JacquelineMidler.com. I'm also on Facebook under Jacqueline Midler, Twitter, um, Jacqueline Midler, and um, Instagram. And then I also have a YouTube channel, um, which is Jacqueline Midler. (laughs) And I periodically put out um, video and um, things on my YouTube channel. 
Well, how can we pray for you in this next part of your journey, these next few months? Well, and I really appreciate that. Um, I always need a lot of prayer. I, I just pray that God would um, continue to open the doors of where he wants White Stick and she writes for him to go um, and just and just continue to touch hearts in this ministry, you know, with women who are choosing abortion or women who have had abortion in their lives. It's just it's a ministry that I feel like it can really bind a woman's soul, even women who are Christians. There's even women who are Christian who I've talked to and they're just like, it's not, they just put it in like a little box in their heart and they dig it a hole and they put it way down deep and they don't, they don't grieve it. They don't choose it. They don't heal from it. And it can wreak a lot of havoc in your um, life. It can wreak a lot of havoc emotionally, physically it can manifest, you know, unresolved grief can really hurt people. And so I feel like, you know, white stick is um, an opportunity for people for people to feel like they're not alone and to kind of sh show people, you know, what happens to a life with unresolved grief. And then um, hopefully they can spend some time in the back of it where I have some um, scriptures and questions to start the healing process. But there's also a ton of different ministries out there where there are Bible studies and group therapy for women um, who in abortion recovery, it's a complete huge ministry. And so I feel like if you could just pray that those women and that my book would touch who it needs to touch and that God would just continue to guide me on the path that he wants me to walk for this. Yeah, sure. That's an honor to pray along with you for all of those things, because this is really um, an important issue and an important topic. So thank you. Drawn Onward is more than an amazing palindrome. It's a production of TeresaJansen.com. 